All right, thanks to everybody for coming today. Uh, I'm Will Carroll, I'm the Director of Communications for ProPlay AI. And uh, let me introduce Dr. Mike Son, who is Chief Scientist also at ProPlay AI. And, and he's gonna talk you through a, a number of things that will help uh, to optimize your usage of the Pitch AI app. So take it away, Mike. Thanks, Will. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mike Son. I'm, uh, as Will mentioned, Chief Scientist at ProPlay, and uh, I am also a biomechanist by training. So I'm just going to share my screen here. And I believe that's working. Will, if it's not, I hold you accountable there, to let yeah. me know. Cool. All right. All right. So I'm going to dive in yeah, here. Exactly. Um, so just um, what we're going to go through today primarily is just what to look for on biomechanics reports. Um, we're going to look at this under the um, under the guise of looking at a few different skill levels. So we're going to look at some amateurs, um, some really high performance amateurs uh, and get into some professionals. But um, I'm going to focus on how we do this um, under the uh, under the framework we established in our introduction to pitching biomechanics course. So for those of you who have not taken our intro to pitching biomechanics course, it is free. Uh, you can find it on our website and the way that we kind of break things down on how to interpret things in pitch AI. Um, we have kind of three categories. We've got our basic, intermediate, and advanced metrics. And then within those, um, there's different metrics in there. So under basic, we've got our arm speed, our stride length, and our external rotation. Under the intermediate, we have our arm path, our hip shoulder separation, and torque. And then under advanced, we have our kinematic sequencing, our deception, our efficiency, and then getting into the joint angles and joint velocities. So um, one of the easiest ways to, to teach is to teach by example and, and to make yourself an example. So what I'm gonna start with here is a demonstration of what we might see for somebody who is not a very skilled uh, pitcher. So I'm just gonna make this full screen here. And this is me throwing in a, a fatigue data collection. And I wanna point out a couple of things as we go along, um, you know, pausing at foot plant there. And this is something I'm going to make reference to throughout here. So some of the things that, you know, are not necessarily great that are happening here, we've got a really short stride length, um, quite a bit in front lead knee flexion. Um, the rest of those things relatively normal in that case. And then obviously that is going to lead into uh, pretty limited external rotation. Uh, torque levels are, you know, within normal range and a lower arm speed there. So I'm just going to pop back out of this and we're going to take a look at basically what we would see on that report itself. So when we're looking at this, you know, under our summary tab here, there's a lot of things that are, are really useful. And one of the most common questions we get asked is basically how does, how does this compare against somebody else? And that's what these light blue, medium blue, and dark blue lines are for in here. So as you can see with basically all of the numbers uh, in this case, we're seeing a lot of these kind of vertical hash lines appearing uh, in that light blue or towards the, the left-hand side. And what that basically means is that when we compare against our database, uh, this report is showing a lot of things that are very low. Um, in this case, you know, we can interpret that as, uh, as being areas for improvement or, uh, you know, like I mentioned already, this picture is not very, very good. So um, that's kind of our summary page here. And, you know, in this case here, if we were to look at this report or, you know, if I was, you know, trying to coach myself up, when I see a lot of things like a really low stride length, you know, getting relatively low on the hip to shoulder, low on external rotation, um, and even when I was doing the pausing there, um, especially at ball release, a low knee extension velocity on that lead knee. 
those are all kind of signs that this person's got limited range of motion, but also limited strength. And if you've ever heard like myself or Casey Mulholland talk about a lot of these things, you try and change mechanics in the weight room. Um, and you try and change mechanics by just moving better. And that happens a lot off the mound, just as much as it happens on the mound. And I would actually argue it happens more off the mound than on the mound. So in that situation, you know, like I said, everything's kind of showing up uh, to the left here. And another one, uh, you know, one of our colleagues here, we're, we're going to see a few things that are a little bit different on this report. Um, but once again, you know, for somebody who has limited skill, you're seeing a lot of these numbers start showing up on the left here, um, you know, particularly with the stride length, particularly with the arm speed, and particularly with the external rotation. You know, th those are our three basic metrics that we like to talk about. But realistically, they're also the three that are the easiest to interpret. And they're also the three that are the most relevant when it comes to velocity out of this group here. Like arm speed's the most highly correlated with velocity, but we also see longer stride lengths are associated with velocity and, and the hip shoulder. Now, what you're gonna often see, uh, and even as we get into some of these more, um, more refined, better performing pitchers, you're gonna see a lot of times that something good does show up. Like in this case here, Nick, who, who we have here, you know, he's do, having a, a good kinematic sequence. He gets, uh, he gets his, his pelvis, then his trunk, then his elbow, then his shoulder. That order of things is good. Uh, but the rest of this here, that we're showing a lot of, uh, a lot of areas for uh, improvement. Now, across the board, when we're looking at lower skilled pitchers, we see that those values are low uh, on those, those, those basic metrics and those key metrics there in, in our summary reports. Um, we see low mobility values. So I'll often look at values on a biomechanics report as either being related to kind of strength or being related to mobility. And the ones that show a lot of mobility and just how well somebody moves are that external rotation, that hip to shoulder separation, and the stride length there. In those cases, when we're seeing something like this, um, you know, low values in those three, that's a real sign that I would go to these pitchers and say, we need to find ways to get this person moving better. And that might start with working with a chiropractor or a physical therapist or, you know, even getting into yoga or just looking at ways to, to kind of move more fluidly. The strength ones, one of the biggest strength ones that I, I like to look at is that, uh, that knee extension velocity. And in that knee extension velocity, um, that is a good sign that that lead leg brace is being used uh, well. The person's getting that knee into the ground, they're getting that leg into the ground, and then they're extending closer to ball release. And in this case, these are on the lower end of the spectrum. And what you'll see with some of the advanced guys are, there's some that stay low, but the really good ones are, are extending very rapidly. So let's get into uh, a few of the better pitchers here. So friend of good friend of uh, of pitch AI here. We've got um, Alden Siggy from from Kinetic Pro and and now going to to UNC. And a lot of his values here, you're going to start to see. I'm getting a bunch of background noise there. Uh, okay. It, on our summaries here, this is where I'm going to show you a lot of the stuff about how how much this is improving. So arm speed, obviously the big one. You know, that's topping out on charts, and, and Alden is, is a really hard thrower. Um, his external rotation, you know, in that upper upper level, and hip shoulder separation in that 56 degrees range. Now, one of the things I want you to pay attention to here is that, keep in mind, we're, we're using a few hundred athletes to establish these ranges. So when something is showing up at the middle or a little bit more, that means they're better than average. So as good as it is to be in this dark blue range for some of these things, and hip to shoulder separation is one of the ones that we do talk about in our training of you want to kind of have an optimal amount. This is really good because he's getting put into a position where he's going to be able to 
uh, accept uh, that force from the lead leg, transfer it to his pelvis, and start that kinematic sequence. Everything else in here, you know, the, the stride length in this case here, maybe a little bit low, uh, and that might be something that could be used as an opportunity for, for improvement. But the rest of this, you know, we're seeing a lot of really good things with how Alden moves uh, in this case. And you'll see kind of in his, his stop motion video here, uh, some of these, these examples. You know, getting into to foot plant, we're getting that 86% of his stride length, which obviously is a lot more than the others. Great amount of external rotation uh, and, and into uh, great arm speed. Now from BDG, um, you know, and this one's possibly not, not an amateur anymore. I know Evan uh, got, uh, got drafted by the Rangers, but this was taken at that time. Um, another example of just doing a lot of things extremely well. We've got a high arm speed, you know, we've got uh, an above average stride length, we've got a little bit lower on the hip shoulder separation side, and that's something I want to talk about a little bit there. Uh, above average external rotation, you know, just another good example of somebody moving extremely, extremely well, um, which is something that the guys at BDG, you know, coming from a clinical background, coming from a uh, chiropractic and therapeutic background, they do a lot of focus on just getting guys to move extremely well. And we can see that one, you know, we had a, a knee extension velocity of, of 200 degrees per second, which is, is starting to get a bit higher there. Now, one of the things that I wanna bring up here, you know, on this topic of hip to shoulder separation, we talk about this in our training program. Um, you want to have hip to shoulder separation. There's no, uh, no doubt about that. With hip to shoulder separation, you're kind of creating that spring effect, but it, what's more important is to close that hip to shoulder separation than to just create it. If you create that separation and you're not closing it quickly or you're not closing it by the time of ball release, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter. And when we look at overall correlates against velocity, you know, the things that predict velocity the most, that is often something that we see. You know, hip to shoulder separation has a pretty loose correlation with velocity, but the closure of it, so the velocity that hip to shoulder separation decreases, that actually is a much stronger relationship with, with ball velocity. So when you see one of these reports, you know, it, it is a nice marker to look at in terms of trying to evaluate fatigue. You know, if you see that number decreasing over time, um, but you know, if you see it and it's low or it's in that first kind of half there, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a matter of saying, hey, let's monitor this and make sure that they're using that to transfer and you know, they're getting that pelvis closed by the time they get to ball release. So once again, you know, we're seeing much higher stride lengths and compared to some of our, uh, our, our poor throwers there, similar positions, a little bit more hip to shoulder for, for Alden. Um, we're seeing a little bit more stride length uh, for, for Evan here, uh, but overall, you know, really happy with what these guys are doing. Uh, and both of them have been really hard workers and, and getting into, um, you know, to further their careers. Now, kind of when we look at great amateur pitchers, I think one of the things that, you know, carries over to the pros is definitely along the line of they do many things well. You know, you don't get to that level and you don't get to 98 miles an hour if you're not doing a lot of, a lot of things well. Um, but seeing something in a low area on your report is not a sign of poor performance. Um, you don't need to go and immediately say, hey, we need to get, you know, more out of your hip to shoulder separation here. It's, if you're seeing everything else is looking good, chances are that that number's that in a good place. At this point, you know, what we often see is that guys are spending so much time in the weight room, they're working a ton. It's really important to make sure that you not only pair their strength training, uh, their resistance training with, with mobility work, but things like your cars and, and things like your, your range of motion stuff, that's really important to make sure that there's nothing that's kind of blocking them from getting into those positions when they're throwing on the mound. 
So I've got two more here to kind of go through before we, you know, dive into to some of the questions around some of this. And um, one of them um, is obviously uh, somebody near and near dear to us at, at ProPlay, and it's it's our uh, our co-founder Nate Pearson. And there's a lot of stuff that Nate does that's <laughs> that's pretty fantastic because uh, he's doing it at six foot six and you know 250 pounds. So, you know, once again, we look at Nate and we see extremely high arm speed. We see, um, we see uh, a good amount of hip to shoulder separation. We see great external rotation. Uh, we see really good stride length there. Um, and then the rest are all kind of where we expect it. You know, we see a higher torque value, um, but when it comes to uh, the torque produced with his arm speed, which is our efficiency there, that's within range. But on this one, you know, what I want to kind of focus on is, is seeing how far he's striding. And this was obviously done before the season. Um, this is when, you know, he was getting ready and working out down at Kinetic Pro. Um, it's not necessarily a max effort, but I still think he was around 94 and 95 on, on this particular throw. And, you know, one of the ones that, I think is uh, maybe the most exciting for me um, is looking at this Tim Lincecum video. And there's some things that happen here. I'm just going to pause it there because, you know, something there jumps. <laughs> there's two numbers here that, that absolutely jump out uh, to me. Uh, one of them is the 96% stride length, which is just like absolutely crazy. Um, you know, it's a really, really long stride. The other is that that huge amount of hip to shoulder separation. Now, when we see like these things like occurring, uh, and as we move through here, um, I, I want to make a few points like along the way. You know, we talk a lot in the way of you know it's important to be big and strong and to uh, you know to move fast and do all these things. Um, one of the things that, <laughs> that I want to bring up is you know. I know Tim isn't a big guy, um, but using him as a template, uh, you know, that's that's really uh, that that can be tough on your pitchers because are they actually moving like Tim Lincecum? What I'd like to point out, kind of on this one here, is this is an example of somebody who is just like absolutely hyper mobile, and if you have an athlete like this, and they kind of pass the basic tests on the strength side of things and they can move this way, you've got something pretty special there. So we've got that extremely long stride length. Um, we've got around an average arm speed here. And once again, this is kind of a bullpen and I'm not sure of the era that this video comes from, but a huge amount of hip to shoulder separation, a huge amount of external rotation, uh, you know, a great efficiency there uh, with high arm speed to, to low torque ratio. And, you know, we see this sign here, you know, the kinematic sequencing down at 50%. And that's just because we see that pelvis and trunk firing at basically the same time. Once again, an example of everything else looks great. It's not a matter of absolutely needing to change this just so you get that order. Um, and it's one pitch. So that's why it's important to kind of look at, at multiples there. So focusing in here on, on ball release, you know, we did talk about that long stride length but something else when we um, we start looking at a comparison between two guys who you know are very very successful at their level, but do it in very 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 different ways, and you can see Tim is really using that lower half a lot. He had the huge amount of hip to shoulder separation, and he's got an extremely high knee extension velocity because he's really trying to get absolutely everything out of, out of that body. You know, I think he's, you know, 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 um, one other thing that, that kind of shows up more in our, uh, in our reports uh, on the angles tab or on the velocities tab, when we look at our amateurs uh, and even our high performance amateurs, one of the predictive variables that we see for velocity is having a really high amount of trunk flexion at ball release. And 
when it comes down to velocity, a lot of things that we've been looking at recently, and this isn't even on our end, this is even if you look into some of the TrackMan data, the whole idea of extension, you know, releasing the ball closer to home plate. Extension comes from a few different places. Some of it is release point. Um, some of it is abduction of the shoulder. Uh, but a lot of it comes down to longer stride lengths and a lot of trunk flexion uh, closer to ball release. So all of those things are kind of working together. And if you look just kind of how far forward both of these guys are as they get to ball release, you know, they're not super upright. It is something we've seen. Now, obviously, there's there's challenges associated with that. And not necessarily you want to say, hey, we're going to coach you into doing this. But when you start working on that stride length, and you start working on moving down the mound like uh, like everyone is kind of coached to, you know, I think this is one of the byproducts uh, in that case. Now, there's a lot of things that these pros do that's very comparable to elite amateurs. Um, but once again, you know, it's not a, a matter of saying you need to have everything in that high range uh, to be good. Um, in many cases, when we start looking at pros or really elite amateurs, it's really a matter of being like, how does this change over time? Or if you're running an intervention, you know, you're giving them certain drills to do, you want to check kind of pre and post to see if it's actually making any sort of a difference there. You can be hypermobile in this case, like Tim Lincecum and uh, we don't have any real video on Marcus Stroman, but I know from kind of looking at different camera angles and that, uh, that is definitely how I would describe him. You know, he moves just absolutely flawlessly um, and he gets everything he can out of, out of his body. Now, you also have another one like Nate, where he's not necessarily as mobile as, uh, as Lincecum, but he's also six foot six and, and 260 pounds. Now, in this case, for both of these guys, and when you're trying to compare your results against a, a pro or, or somebody of a higher level, um, you know, let's say you do say somebody doesn't have to be big to be uh, a major league pitcher. Well, if they're not big. They, do they move like Tim Lincecum or Marcus Stroman? Or let's say you're saying, you know, somebody doesn't have to have a, a ton of hip shoulder separation or, you know, they don't have to move a certain way. You know, are they six foot six uh, as well? So it's important to kind of consider all of these things uh, when we're starting to do our, our evaluations and starting to break down uh, some of this information. So kind of our, our global summary here, before I, I let Will kind of chime in a little bit and, and open the floor for questions, you don't have to have it all, but, it, but having it all sure helps. <laughs> it, uh, it makes things a lot easier for you. We don't see a lot of pitchers that are super high on absolutely every aspect of it. Um, you know, there, there's very few that come through and we see that they're, you know, flawless on, on every, every area um, or, you know, in that 95th percentile range. You don't have to correct everything either. And you do want to change mechanics off the mound as much as you can. It's about moving well, it's about being strong. And then when it does come to chain down to changes uh, and you want to implement changes via constraint drills or whatever you might uh, be doing, it's really important to kind of identify where are your limitations. So if you're thinking, you know, the kinematic sequence is something you want to work on. We found that it did significantly impact the kinematic sequence to do the janitor drills at a baseball development group. Uh, any of these kind of constraint-based approaches, if you can compare those back to pitching and see, you know, what exactly has changed, it's a good evidence-based way, uh, evidence way to kind of implement biomechanics in your, in your program. So, Will, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, uh, and we can start diving into some questions uh, that anybody might have. Absolutely. Again, thanks to Dr. San for uh, taking the time to break all those down. Uh, seeing uh, Tim Lincecum in that kind of detail was really special to me. Uh, back in 2006, I did a series of videos for MLB.com and uh, did Tim Lincecum without the benefit of, you know, data or science. Uh, so everybody that has a question, there are two ways we can go about this. You can type it into the chat and we can take care of that. 
or uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question verbally, but I'll ask uh, everybody to try to be not speaking at once. Uh, we'll take those one at a time. We don't have really uh, a, sort of a hand raising system, but uh, yeah, we're all adults here, we can handle it. Uh, so who has the first question? Uh, Stephen has one that says, uh, do you see any correlation between a higher torque value and low efficiency and in injury? So the, the long and the short of that is that not necessarily in our research, we have seen guys that produce higher torques uh, be more likely to sustain an injury. That being said, it does not tell the entire story. And if you look at kind of how the body works and how most of these biomechanics systems predict torque, I'm just gonna do a quick anatomy lesson here. So in our arms, we have a muscle that goes right here in our forearm. And it's kind of called, we call this the pronator mass. And the pronator mass has a group of muscles here that have a tendon that goes into uh, the upper arm. And when you're in that throwing motion, it activates and it protects the elbow from that stress that puts strain directly on the ulnar collateral ligament. And as that muscle becomes fatigued, what tends to happen is more of the force gets transmitted away from the muscle and directly to the ligament. Now, one of the things that we can't tell from a biomechanics analysis like you just saw, or even in a lab, is how much that muscle is contributing to limiting torque on that, that ligament there. So somebody could move extremely fast and throw extremely hard, and they might have a very low amount of torque going to that ligament because they're timing that muscle activation at the exact right moment. And it's preventing that transmission of force directly to the ligament. You might also see somebody who has relatively low torque on our analysis or in other biomechanics analysis, and they might sustain an injury um, in the future. And it's just because it's not going directly to that ligament. What I would say is that if you see an athlete who has a high torque or low efficiency, that's somebody that you should be monitoring possibly a little bit more closely and just kind of keeping keeping an eye on some of their ratings of comfort and, and how their arm feels. Make sure you're paying attention to things like their workload. Um, in that case, I think you would go that direction more than just saying, hey, if it's a low efficiency or high stress, this person's at a higher risk of injury. Mike, uh, I have a follow-up to that question, and thanks, Stephen, for that one. Um, I noticed in your video that you pronate kind of hard, uh, and, and by what I mean by that is he turns his thumb down uh, at or maybe even a little bit before ball release. I know that's not something that, that ProPlay AI measures, but do you find that uh, you know something that you're interested in or something that people should note uh, when they're watching the mechanics? Um, so the idea, you know, and the idea behind it, even like a lot of Dr. Marshall's work was that the idea of pronating, put your elbow in a position to use that pronator mass and protect the UCL. Now, there's also been some work like Ben Hansen did some stuff where he didn't necessarily see that. Um, it is a difficult one to now analyze because we're looking at EMG and EMG in this type of thing or electromyography, which is like measuring how active a muscle is hasn't always necessarily been the easiest to do in pitching. Um, there's some oh, kind needles. of, the, yeah, the, well, it, the surface works too, um, in that case, particularly, but um, there is some theoretical evidence to suggest that's the case. It would be interesting to dive in uh, a little bit more. I would also say, Will, that I suffer from a, a condition um, called right arm shittiness. <laughs> uh, and that, uh, that shouldn't be used to teach anybody on how to throw. Yeah, just, it was interesting to me. A uh, couple more questions in the chat. And of course, make sure uh, you drop it in there or we'll figure out how to get this done. Uh, the next is from JJ. Do you see one variable influence arm speed any more than another? For example, as hip and shoulder separation increases, does that also show a correlation and in increase in arm speed? Mm -hmm. If there's one thing that has kind of related back um, 
to a lot of these variables kind of working together, I would say that it has been stride length and the knee extension velocity. Um, those two from the lower half seem to correlate very well with arm speed. Um, I would also say, you know, even related to that, that forward trunk flexion seems to be seems to be in there as well. Hip to shoulder separation is a very interesting one. And Dean Jackson from Driveline has done a great, great, great series on uh, on hip shoulder separation and how it relates to velocity. And if you go and visit the Kinetic Pro website and go into the Connect educational series, I kind of talked a little bit about some of Dean's work in there. The idea behind hip to shoulder separation is that, you know, if this is your femur and this is your pelvis, you want your pelvis to be kind of at the right amount of an angle to accept the force from the pelvis and cause or the femur and cause it to rotate. If it's too open, you know, they kind of just bash into each other. If it's too closed, there's not enough kind of hinge to do that. And it kind of works that way with the entire body. Like I was mentioning, if you can't get that hip to shoulder separation closed, it doesn't really matter how much of it you got. So keep that in mind there. Definitely. We've got a question from Ryan, and I'll take this one. Uh, is there some kind of guide that you guys have for what drills to improve certain parts of our mechanics? For example, is there something we could do to say uh, to increase external rotation, do this drill? Uh, the simple answer for us is uh, we don't want to tell coaches how to do things. Think of this as, you know, we're the architects measuring out what to build. We're not going to tell uh, the, the carpenters how to hammer together the frame. We do have ideas, we're human beings, but we think that coaches are gonna have different opinions on what works best for them. They're gonna be the ones with their hands on the athlete. And so we've stayed back from that. We'll probably delve a little bit more into that over time, but we, we believe that the coaches are the ones that have the athlete, have the knowledge. Uh, and if you're a coach that doesn't have that knowledge, Again, as Mike said at the start, I would really recommend our intro to biomechanics courses. Uh, there are a number of great coaches doing things around the country. Uh, he mentioned Casey Mulholland and his Connect education program. I uh, highly recommend that one as well. Uh, but again, this is one where we, we want to be Switzerland. We don't want to tell a coach how to coach. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that too. So let's just say like, you know, a lot of drills and a lot of training methods come with pros and cons. And I think you need to go into it with that mindset. So let's use external rotation as an example. External rotation is correlated. You have more external rotation. You typically have higher velocity. You also typically have more stress on the arm. Now, if we have looked at different kind of training constraint drills or, or different implementations, long toss has been shown to increase external rotation. Weighted baseballs have been shown to increase external rotation, but there are obviously things considered with those to keep in mind. So what I would recommend in that case is that you kind of do your own testing. Um, you know, Lennon and the guys at BDG did a great job at looking at some of their constraint drills and how kinematics change compared back to their mound work. And if you have a drill that you're trying to use to do a certain thing, make sure that it's doing it, compare it back to the mount and, and see if it's actually increasing that, that one variable. Yeah, great one. Uh, I know working with some pitchers last year, I had always used a drill to increase stride length where I would place uh, a brick and have them kind of step over it. And that was actually one that I had stolen fra from uh, Chris Lincecum, Tim's dad and original pitching coach. Uh, turns out it's not actually that good. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that uh, really, there are better drills. It's not that that one's horrible, but it does create some problems for an athlete that doesn't have great uh, hip control, doesn't have uh, great core strength. So uh, again, I, I think Mike hit the nail on the head. You now have a tool that allows you to see whether what you're working on with an athlete is working. And, and isn't that what we all want? Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, Ryan asks, uh, would you say that a pitcher that is that has an arm speed of 31 meters per second is using too much arm? First off, that's really, really fast. Yeah. 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 So, no, I would not say it's a matter of too much arm. Um, arm speed as a metric is basically a summation. So the way that we calculate arm speed is we look at the wrist and we look at how that wrist is traveling towards home plate. 
And Ooh, if you're using, yeah, it's basically a, in biomechanics terms, it's tangential velocity of how fast that arm is, is moving. It's how fast that kind of end point of your arm is moving in the direction of home plate. Now, you know, if you had really low hip to shoulder separation, you had uh, really low knee extension velocity, you had a really low stride length, uh, and somehow got that up to 31, that might be a sign that maybe <laughs> it's quote unquote too much arm in that situation. Uh, but no, I would not say that using the arm speed to say, you know, too much, that, that, that's not the interpretation there. Uh, another question from JJ, can you briefly explain how arm path is measured? Yeah, so arm path is measured as the, uh, the total distance that the wrist travels between peak kick height and foot plant. And it's measured in units of height. So it's basically like if I go into my kick and I'm kind of like traveling backwards with my arm, and then as I get into foot plant, you know, I'm really going a long direction there. We would see somebody, you know, kind of who landed like this have a much longer arm path than somebody who landed, you know, like a Lucas Giolito where his, his arm was really short here. So arm path is just meant to be kind of, uh, it's meant to be the surrogate uh, and the complement to saying somebody has a long arm action or a short arm action. And it's once again, one of those things that's not necessarily having long or short is better. We've actually seen in some of our work, if you compare it to torque, extremely short and extremely long have higher torques. And then in the middle, it, it's a little bit of a sweet spot. You don't hear anybody described as having a, a middle arm. Uh, Steven asks a follow-up question. As far as deception goes, how do you see coaches using that? Is it more optimal for the number to be less or more? Uh, simple answer yeah. there, more is better. <laughs> uh, so yes, more in the sense of, <laughs> so it's kind of a flip value, right? So the deception value is in units of milliseconds. And what deception is in our system, it's the total amount of time between foot plant and ball release that a simulated hitter would be able to see the ball from out behind the body. And there's certain things there. Like if you looked at my pitching there, I think I had a really low deception. So there wasn't a lot of time between foot plant and ball release that the hitter could see it, except the fact that, you know, the pitch was 70 miles an hour. So that's a lot of time to see it. So the best way to use deception is that if you're working with a ball tracking system, to kind of compare people who have similar velocities. So if you have two guys throwing 90 and one of them has a way higher value under deception, like say it's 120 milliseconds and the other guy has an extremely low value of 80 milliseconds, the one who has the 80 millisecond, that would probably be the one who was more deceptive in the way that we're defining it there. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting one. That's one I know I've had a lot of pitchers that have, you know, been sneaky fast or that guys say they don't pick the ball up out of his hands. Uh, I can't wait to see some of those guys from last year who we can uh, measure on pro play AI and see whether or not that that is exactly what it is or whether you know, it's just a location thing or the fact that he was left-handed, something like that. Listen, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, again, this recording will be available uh, for all time on YouTube. Uh, we'll get that up uh, pretty quick. I know everybody couldn't make it at this time. And I definitely want to thank Dr. Michael Son for uh, taking the time to break these down, help everybody understand some of these metrics and help their pitchers. Uh, thanks again for everybody uh, for showing up and for using ProPlay AI. Thanks everyone.